and do some, I think you know how that story goes. You've heard it in your, rattling in your ears. But he had a great idea. He had a product. Here's the Tesla coil on the top. Here are the sparks. And even in Rome, this might protect your car. So <laughs> the, the science business has unexpected valuable uh, possibilities. So we've had to, you know, lots of experiences with that, and now we transmit our uh, power sometimes by high voltage direct current. But everybody has been impacted by the information coming in. So in, in the early time, I had a lot of great, great preprints, and we could you know, understand what they were, and we got to about 10,000, and they were organized just numerical, and then I had index cards that connected numbers and authors. And then uh, we had an advance in technology, <laughs> and so it was possible to really get ahead of this curve, or maybe not quite ahead, but Anyway, sort of keep up. So now my little notebook computer, which we're using now, has got you know, 40,000 or 50,000 PDF files in it of good stuff, which you can use. And so the idea is to sit in a nice, cushy place, a beach maybe, Virginia Beach, we were just che checking this out. And you could type and add in a footnote and a reference and have all that and uh, maybe get some more grant money. I don't know. So what I'd like to talk about now is the latest news from 1992, let's see, where can I stand? Uh, this epoch of 99, that's surprising that my laser pointer is unstable. Uh, <laughs> it's bad for me, isn't it? So, so Hinch and Chebataev put up an idea that they called a comb, optical comb, and I'll tell you what that is in 97. And then people were working on ultra short pulses and they came to some particular value, 10 to the minus 14 seconds, uh, a hundredth of a millionth of a millionth of one second. It's not very long. I was working with my uh, guys and we got the same number, if 10 to the minus 14, but this is the fractional frequency stability. And roughly speaking, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. And then I learned about some new uh, nonlinear material, and I'll talk about this. Uh, it's a nonlinear fiber that really lights up when the light goes through it. And uh, it was a thrill in Duke that the guy who brought this into the world's awareness came into the audience. So we had a marvelous talk with Janendra Rankin. So what I am responsible for, my group, is merging four separate technologies, and as I uh, tried to indicate, we sort of have made a new Swiss Army knife. If you want to work in this business, we've got a great tool for you. So this idea, uh, so to say, gets legs and was brought into publication by my colleague in uh, Germany, Ted Hench. Uh, we had a more uh, advanced model in which we could go in a single step from a frequency like the FM band frequency. We could jump from that clear up to the optical, even though that's a huge gap of uh, more than a million. And there were, uh, within a year, there were 20 papers that appeared, and uh, within uh, five years, there was this uh, almost unprecedented recognition of something so fast by the Nobel Prize Committee. So, this is a remarkable new um, possibility and new measurements are possible. How did this start? Well, this starts with me as a young boy, a postdoc, 1961 maybe. I went to a conference to hear this man, Ali Javan, the inventor and designer of the helium neon laser. So there's lasers that are pulsed lasers. You put huge energy into a flash lamp and you get uh, maybe laser action. This guy started with a seven-year postdoc at Bell Labs, and he had the idea that you could get optical gain. You could send in an optical signal, and it would get amplified, maybe 1%. Hit a mirror, you'd lose half a percent. Send it back, it's amplified another 1%. Turn it around, lose half a percent. And it could go back and forth lots of times, and it would build up. Except that the tiny problem was that how could you ever get the mirrors lined up well enough because it has to go back and forth hundreds and hundreds of times. So there was no way to do that with the technology that was being used. 
And finally, uh, the joy of having a team, multidisciplinary team. One of the guys was a guy who was part of the mechanical design group. And he says, well, let's see, the problem is that you can't get it lined up. How, would, how do we do automatic alignment and go through all the values? The answer is, you bonk it. And then the bars bend, and it oscillates, and it goes through the right alignment one time. And then this thing bursts into oscillation, as was calculated to be do, uh, possible. And the result of that is, you know, this detector, ultimately sensitive detector that can see one photon by one photon coming. All of a sudden, it gets uh, 10 to the 16th photons coming into it. I don't know how many million, million, million that is, but it's a lot. And it uh, blew out their photomultiplier. But wow, what a, what a gift, because this is the first time a continuous operating thing had run. So they were running two of them, and they made a beat between these two, th these frequencies are 300 times a uh, million million. So th times 10 to the 12th oscillations in one second. But the difference between them is less than a thousand. So that's something we can hear. And in fact, he had put it on a recorder. In fact, he played it in the auditorium. So you could hear this <laughs> kind of sound coming uh, down. And uh, I realized that the theory said that these lines could be not a thousand hertz or cycles per second wide, but they could be one one thousandth of a cycle wide. So from one 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 thousandth in theory all the way up to this 10 to the 14th number, that is the hugest dynamic range that humans have ever fooled with. And I said, I want to play in this game. So that changed me from one half of this playing field to the other half. We had the pulse lasers, and they were pretty fun. You could burn a hole in a Gillette blade, and uh, they, you could focus the light down and make an air spark, and the boys in the military labs could make thousands of joules. And after tens and twenties of years, uh, they learned how to make this work as uh, femtosecond lasers, repeating pulses. And uh, so I went up here and penetrated this impenetrable barrier and joined with the guys that were working with these continuous lasers that only made a thousandth of a watt. But their beams could be made more and more coherent. And I'll uh, go quickly through the story about how the, our team learned how to measure the frequency of that and the wavelength. And finally, we could uh, learn the, uh, what the meter was in the old units and define it in new units. And as I say, in the year 2000 or so, this gap in uh, intellectual dichotomy between pulse lasers and continuous lasers simply went away and became a, a porous thing. And we could go move back and forth on these things uh, to totally. And when uh, we're done, if I do my job right, you'll be able to explain to your grandmother how this uh, really works in the uh, first principles language. So the, this uh, business of measuring the wavelength was interesting because we had this uh, wavelength standard. And here was the previous wavelength standard, a certain transition in Krypton. And you see the interferometer that's optimized for it shows you plenty of noise. Here is a completely unoptimized thing with a laser, and it has almost no noise. And so uh, it's, it's a no-brainer about which, where you want to go. You want to jump again to a new standard, and even though this old standard produces an uncertainty of 4 times 10 to the minus 9. I don't know how many people are co comfortable with this exponential notation, but when I say 10 to the minus something, it means you should think of 1 over 10, and then 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 laid out 9 times. So this is a pretty big number, 1 billion, 4 and 1 billion. So how are you going to measure the optical frequencies? Well, the starting point is what the present standard is, which is based on cesium, 9 times uh, 10 to the ninth, or 9 billion cycles in a second. Actually, I like this frequency. It's completely amazing. 919, that's an area code, 263-1770. So somebody had to change their telephone number because it, you know, it's, bozos like me would try that to see what that is. The target frequency we're going for is way high. It is 1 times 10 to the 15th. Look at all these numbers. There's a decimal point, a comma, a comma, a comma, a comma, a comma. 1 and 15 zeros, and this number now is known to that precision. So this is the most precise physical number that 
a uh, man knows a woman. So the frequency ratio that we need is 115,000. And the question is, uh, how the heck are we going to do that? So as I mentioned, I worked for the government, so we have a government plan. <laughs> it, it's to do seven with electronics and 14 with lasers. Now, let me mention 14 stages, everyone is going to give you factor two. Now, what does that look when you go in the lab? Well, here is three stages. You get a factor two from this one, factor two from this one, factor two. Each one of these wavelengths is twice shorter or the frequency is twice larger. Each one is completely different technology, needs its own PhD guy to guide it and hold it. Maybe some of the well-developed ones, one guy could do two lasers. This needed a big team. So finally, we were 12 persons and working in the nights and the uh, blessed ladies, uh, when it was run, a night that we were gonna run, uh, they were bringing in chicken salad sandwiches and we could uh, keep working. So the speed of light program for uh, our National Bureau of Standards was to use this completely simple formula from undergraduate physics that the velocity is the frequency times the wavelength. And the way that we got the frequency is by Ken Evenson's group that measured the frequency of 88 uh, million, million cycles in a second. And it was a bunch of guys uh, at Jilla, it's a kilometer away in that building that I showed you. We measured the wavelength. And that turned out to be 3.39 millionths of a meter. And that was done in collaboration with Dick Barger. So that was a great thing. What came out of that then was this number 29979247. That's in old units. But then there was a meeting of 50 countries sitting around. By that time, uh, all the laboratories across the world, maybe 12 national laboratories made a contribution. We averaged them all up and decided that an easier number would be 458 in the last place. So that will be the right answer on the quiz that you'll get when you go out. 29979 meters per second, and that's exact. In fact, that's even our finest product. So a go into the picture of that then was the meter was previously defined by some meter bar, then it was defined by that krypton transition that I showed you the fringes of, and now it's defined so that uh, in vacuum light travels one over this, and so you'll recognize that that's effectively a definition of the speed of light. So it's a redefinition, but it's really important about that because uh, this business of standards is something that you can really get your heart into if you're uh, not careful. Because you try to figure out how do you know how big something is and how does it change or how does it stay stable. So well, you need a standard to compare it with. And there are no really natural standards that say, you know, here I am in nature and I'm exactly 10 centimeters long. We have things in nature and they come all kinds of lengths, but we do have some things which are more stable than others. And the wavelength that comes from light, from uh, atoms, is a good choice, but the frequencies that are defined by atomic transitions are even more precise. Of course, there's a connection between those, but by probing them as a frequency, we have the opportunity to use coherence, and that allows us to get much better performance. So with this definition, redefinition, it effectively is demoting. We used to have seven primary constants that we needed in order to describe all of physical experience, and now we have six. Well, that was a big deal. The NIST, was, or NBS was kind, and they uh, really gave a great thing about it. Actually, this was a celebration at the time, but now it makes me very sad because uh, uh, Ken even first of all, I look a little younger in the picture. Uh, secondly, Ken Evenson got some bad disease and died. Dick Barger had cancer and died. Russ Peterson died. And Gordon went to be a manager. I mean, <laughs> give, me a, give me a break. So I'd like to return then about the spectroscopy because that was one of the things that was in the citation. So here is the power output vertically and here's the frequency that a methane stabilized laser makes. 
and it can be stabilized because of these incredible